I'm sure in traveling into places that maybe you have not been that familiar with, that you've got yourself lost at times. That can easily happen around Houston. You lived here, I guess, 100 years going into places. And you are managing some way or the other to find your way out back on to familiar ground. Over the years, especially when I was growing up, spending lots of times out in the woods, I remember one time going squirrel hunting, and we used to call it getting turned around. <laughs> it's simply another way of saying you're lost. And it's an odd feeling to, especially when you've tried to get yourself straightened back out and find out you're walking in circles. And invariably you will without some way of getting out. One time, a friend of mine and, uh, involved in a frog hunt, went frog gigging up around Fort Smith, Arkansas, and Arkansas River, of course, runs through there, and a lot of old river lakes and they farmed all around them, so the lakes had filled up to where they're probably deepest part, and all of them might have been four feet of water if it's that deep. Trees had grown up all around them for years and years. And I mean, the frogs were all over the place, and they were big. So we went out there several times. But this time, we got out amongst all those trees, and you couldn't tell what was which and where, and you couldn't see beyond your light actually got the boat hung up between the trees. And I remember trying to get it from between the trees, and he was in one end and I was the other, and I looked and we had pried it around somewhere or the other, had the whole boat out of the water stuck up between the trees. So all sorts of things can happen when you're lost. Well, we managed to finally get ourselves out, and I think I got home about four o'clock that morning. And if you are interested, we had a tow sack literally full of frogs. Frogs didn't get tended to it. Four o'clock in the morning, they just got thrown in the freezer in the sack. And frogs have a way of staying alive even when frozen. So the next day, I took care of them. But being lost, just the word lost, if you think about it, it almost has a sound to it. And we've lost things sometimes, too. I remember our first year of marriage, mother had given me back in the eighth grade a, a ring, and we made a little garden out behind the apartment where we lived or tried to. And I'm quite sure I lost that ring in that garden. I never found it. It's gone as far as I'm concerned, forever as far as this world's concerned. Had sentimental value, it's a nice little ring too. But so what? It's gone. So you might say when you're lost, you're, you're gone. There is a song, and I asked Gary, it was in the song book, I didn't have one home when I was looking, but it's an old song, it's written in 1923. And in the chorus, it has have you counted. Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost if your soul should be lost? If your soul should be lost. The death of deaths. The tragedy of all tragedies that could, that could not be any greater. The same will be too of the loss of all losses. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, people regularly and routinely, and I'm sad to say the majority of them, give 
such frivolous things, to the neglect of their soul. And we learn from Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And from Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, separation from God. And thus people become lost in their sins and separated from God. There's much that we can glean about counting the cost if your soul should be lost by looking at Matthew 16, 26. Our Lord uses the word soul, S-O-U-L, as referring to that entity that is not identified with the fleshly body, nor actually with time in space. That is, as far as its reason for existing. While it's in our body, it is limited by time and space in the sense that that's what it takes to be alive in the body is to have the soul in the body. I might mention here that the word soul and spirit can mean the same thing. Spirit usually always means the inner man or the real you, as does the word heart of which we spoke about some time ago. Soul sometimes, it's a generic term, can mean the spirit, can also mean the body and other things too. But here our Lord is using soul to mean your inward man that after the body is returned to dust, it continues on. <coughs> There's a reason for that. Our soul is made in the image of God. Like begets like. Genesis 1, 26, 27 makes it clear that God is our Father, as does the Hebrews writer. We are called the offspring of God by Paul in his sermon on Mars Hill in Acts 17, 28. Jesus said concerning deity that he is spirit. He's an everlasting spirit without beginning or ending in Romans 16, 26. And we know that a spirit is not identified with flesh and bones for the apostles thought after they saw the Lord following his resurrection. They said, he's a spirit on one occasion. And Jesus said, no, flesh and no spirit hath not flesh and bones which ye see me have. Luke 24, 39. So we possess a spirit. I don't really like to call it we possess. Actually, our spirits possess a body. It's a temporary dwelling place. It's only meant to live in this world. The body is not meant to live in eternity. Jesus plainly said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. I don't know what the resurrected body will be like, saving to say it will be like Christ. All I know is it will not be like this body in the sense of whatever makes it up. And of course God said we're made of the dust of the ground and when man sinned he said that we would return to the dust. When we die and James plainly said the body apart from the spirit is dead. But the song is aimed at getting us to think about the eternal part of us. Or maybe better said the immortal part of us. So we are spirit as far as the real you, and the real me dwelling in this body. And it's going to continue to exist. We don't think about this. We read over it. But we must realize that when a child is conceived, a child will never end. That person will exist. Temporarily, for a period of time, 
It'll be on earth, time and space, material things. It'll have the appetites fitted for this world in the body. But then that will end and that same soul, the same you, the person you are now that's dwelling in this body will go on into eternity and there exist forever. And it's rather amazing, no matter how long you live in the church and try to know the truth and live accordingly and form the viewpoints that only the Word of God can, that we don't give enough thought to the fact that we're just passing through. This is a pilgrimage, a place to show God we love Him, that we'll bring our thoughts and our action to the subjection to His will and we'll show our faith in Him by taking Him at His word. The receptacle of the body and soul is something to think about. In a prophecy related to Christ, in Acts 2 and verse 27, David was speaking. Peter quoted him, showing what David was actually saying, because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, actually. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Well, he would raise him from the third day, thus even his physical body would not return to dust. But his physical body, following his death on the cross, was placed in Joseph's tomb, Matthew 27, 57 through 60. And his soul went to the Hadean world. He had told the thief on the cross, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. They would be conscious entities in paradise. That's significant because the word with means you're aware of my presence. If you were unconscious, how would you know whether you were there and you weren't? That is an unseen world. The idea is that Hades is an unseen world. And as we've noticed in the study of Luke 16, the Hadean world is divided into two parts. The great gulf divides them. Paradise, Peter calls the other as far as that's concerned, Tartarus meaning torment. And so says the rich man after he dies, if that's what he's undergoing. But they're still the same people. That's what I want us to understand. They still have the memories of their life on earth. They still think. And at the Mount of Transfiguration, not long before the Lord died, you have Moses, Elijah. They've been transfigured. Well, they were in the Hadean world. Christ was on this world still in the flesh. But when they're transfigured, they're all together. And they're discussing, we learn, the very death of Christ himself. Uh, that My curiosity just takes hold of me here. What were they telling Christ about death? I don't know. So in death, then the body which has the soul in it goes back to the dust from which it originally came so man is not holy body completely body completely fleshly man also is immortal because he's fathered by God the soul shall never die we have a funny thought about death a lot of it's erroneous among a lot of people. At the point of death, the soul leaves the body. Well, it doesn't just cease to be. It doesn't just go into unconsciousness. There's not a thing in the New Testament that talks about that. It'll talk about the view of the body being dead as if it's asleep. And so they'll refer to the body asleep. Why, even today, when people are embalmed, and as they used to say young years ago, laid out a my grandmother used to say, laid out a corpse. They still look like they're at peace. 
I've even seen situations where people have undergone such torment and the illness that killed them that uh, they look better physically dead than they did while they were alive. So it has a person looking into their sleep. That's about the only way we think of rest in this life. But actually there's another rest. And that's the peace of the soul. And it comes from knowing you're reconciling your God. Think of it this way. God doesn't have anything against me anymore. Oh, how can that be? Have you ever thought about people you had some sort of run-in with? And maybe you said, well, I hope he's settled. I, I certainly don't have anything against him or her. And, Hopefully she doesn't have anything against me. But if you're a child of God, a member of the church, faithful to the Lord, you've been reconciled to God. You're justified in His sight. Now how many people in this world who are accountable to Him right now for His actions can actually say, God doesn't have anything against me anymore? Isn't that a marvelous thing? I call that peace. I call that happiness. Oh, it doesn't mean I'm free of my struggles to keep myself in subjection to the truth. As I'm accountable to God for my actions, I have to do all I can according to my several abilities to bring my life in subjection to Christ. Even the great Apostle Paul, great because of his faith and love of God, would say that after having preached to others, he sought not to be a castaway because he sought to buffet his body and bring it into subjection. So we live that kind of life. But we know this, while we're doing that, while we're fighting the fight of faith, as we labor from day to day to bring our minds and bodies into subjection to the will of Christ, which we learn from his word, we're doing it as children of God. We're the only ones as members of the Lord's church and all that that means in the New Testament who can say that. God is shaping and molding us in the church. It's not that every time we stumble and blink an eye that, well, aha, uh -huh, I caught him in that, I'll throw him off the cliff. It's not it at all. I like the way Brother Guy Woods many, many years ago said about the soul at the point of death. We all know that all of us are different degrees of growth and development. Some because we're young in the faith. Others because we're older in the faith. What does that mean? Well, we know more. We face more of life's problems with the truth of God's word. We understand it better. We study it more. We have deeper insights. Oh, some are babes in Christ. Some are weak in the faith. Some are strong. They can digest the stronger, meatier matters of God's word. And that's what we have in the congregation or the church worldwide. People at different degrees of growth and development. Well, if you've got somebody who's been a faithful member of the church for two years and somebody who's been a faithful member of the church for 50 years, is the time that they were members of the church alone going to determine whether they are acceptable to God or not? No. And Brother Wood said, you know, it comes down to this. It's which direction you're going at the time of your death that makes the difference. That's what's meant in 1 John 1 and verse 7. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Those present tense verbs means the blood I contacted in the waters of baptism continue to flow to keep me clean because I know which direction I'm headed to go. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that I don't need to know more. It doesn't mean that I won't stumble. It doesn't mean any of those things that would remove from me the weaknesses of the human flesh. But remember, 
When we were baptized into Christ, having first believed in him, repented of our sins, and confessed our faith in him as the Son of God, we were baptized into a realm of grace, a realm of favor. Now, what does it mean? It means that in Christ, as we're striving to live according to the truth, we have our ups and downs, and just think of Peter. You'll know what I'm talking about, the Apostle Peter. It means we have something that makes up the difference because we're in a state of favor with God. Do we really think that can reach a stage in this life where there's no more room for growth and development, no more need for prayer, no more need for encouragement for one another and so on and so forth, that's an everyday part of Christian living and being faithful? I hope not. What we will all be so happy about that there are no words to truly describe it is to realize that it is God's mercy and grace that will allow our Lord to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. But have you counted the cost if your soul should be lost? And fear not him which is able to kill the body, but not able to kill the soul. He says, I'll tell you whom you should fear. Fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Well, you see, there's a proper fear that should be with us all the days of our life. Proper awe and respect of Jehovah God Almighty. We don't want to violate His will. We've cast our lot through faithful obedience of the gospel to be with Christ. We know the direction we're headed down that straight and narrow way of divine truth. And we may, and I will say, we will from time to time stumble. <coughs> That's why that we have the New Testament teaching concerning how we gain remission of sins once we are Christians in sin. How do we keep our souls? Because there's an ever an attitude, a disposition of mind, a humility that is ready to confess our sins. Now it's made clear in verse 8 of 1 John 1 that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I know many times we're thinking about specific sins we've committed, and that's what's there. It doesn't necessarily say that. It certainly covers those specific sins that we're to repent of and confess and ask God for forgiveness. But the general idea is that we're constantly realizing we're imperfect no matter how much Bible we know and how well we practice it. To live faithful is not to keep a law perfectly. Doesn't mean obedience is not involved. It doesn't mean that you're not striving to bring your mind and life in subjection to those truths of God's word that tell us how we should conduct our lives. But it means we're in a state of grace or favor to where we can always keep on going ahead always pressing on. It doesn't mean we must any less stop striving. The Bible's full of material. But it means for those who do strive in this state of grace, where is that? In the Lord's church. We're baptized into Christ. The Lord adds us to his church, Galatians 3.27, Acts 2.47. The blood flows in the body of Christ. Who makes up the body? The individual Christians who heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. And it keeps us cleansed. If you can picture it in your mind, if such were to be the case, I'm not saying it is, but for sake of illustration, 
the devil is standing over here and everybody that comes before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body. Picture him is standing over there saying, yeah, but so-and-so did this, he didn't do that, he did what, 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 on down the line. He finds all sorts of things wrong with us. But in Christ, mark that, in Christ, you're in a state of favor and you were headed the right direction as you labored to bring your life in subjection to the truth all the days of your life on this earth so that when you die, you die in a state of favor. Do we really believe that we can get to a stage where there's no room for correction and no possibility that you can get any better in service to God than you are now? If that was the case, salvation would be under the law of Moses. But we're not under a perfect, complete, and only a law system. We're under the New Testament of Christ that extends grace and mercy to those who need it. I've been a member of the church a long time. I still need grace and mercy. Do you? If it wasn't for grace and mercy... Where would the comfort come that says we're to have the peace that passes all understanding? God's on our side, folks. He doesn't want to see a one of us lose our soul, but he wants to see us striving to bear our crosses daily and to do the Lord's will. And he will make up the difference. If that's not the case, I missed the boat a long time ago. So to be lost is really to trust in oneself. To not trust in God and his system of salvation. It's not just a matter of believing in God that he exists and he loves us and Christ is our Savior. It's a matter of believing in the system God's ordained to save us too. You can have faith in the existence of God and the deity of Christ. But do you take the Christ at his word? He said to the apostles, Now ye are clean through the word I've spoken to you. Now, you think about that for a minute. Go back and read about those apostles. He said that before he ever died on the cross. Now ye, you apostles, are clean. How? Through the word I have spoken unto you. But look at some of the things they did and believed and didn't know. What held them in their justified state before God? He even told them, you don't understand what I'm doing now, later you will. But they were still reconciled to him. They were still clean. Clean, cleanse from sin. It's the mercy of Christ. The woman taken in adultery, he never said she didn't sin. When he got through with that whole thing, knowing the evil motives of the people that brought her, he simply said to her, where are your accusers? Well, they weren't there. They'd walked away, starting from the oldest to the youngest. He said, neither do I condemn thee. She's a sin. We haven't heard a peep out of her. Do you notice that? The scriptures is a recorded thing, except when she responded that they had all left when he asked, where are your accusers? And he just said, neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way and sin no more. There's the whole idea of being faithful to God. My soul is the most precious thing I have. Lost that ring I told you about. I'd love to have it again. No, I'll never see it again in this life, ever. Unless somebody accidentally finds it up there. And I don't know how they know how to unite it with me, but as far as I'm concerned, it's gone forever. That, my soul is so much more priceless than anything I have other of this world. It's the most priceless thing that I possess. I'm the one that determines whether it will go into eternity in heaven or Eternity in torment and a devil's hell. 
What makes it a priceless thing? Because of its origin, it came from God, Hebrews 12, 9. Zechariah 12, 1 says plainly that it's God that forms the spirit within man. And we learn, of course, from Ecclesiastes 12, 7, that the spirit returns to God who gave it when we die. The soul transcends the earth and all of the powers that are here. We have the power, and if we worship God in spirit and in truth, we have been communing with God already today in this assembly. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. Our worship must be directed by the will of heaven. And we must have our minds set upon God as we engage in these acts of worship. That is, our worship must be commensurate with its object. The soul was redeemed by the blood of Christ. We talk about that a lot. But just think for a minute, how important to God is my soul, which tells me how important my soul ought to be to me. Well, what did heaven do to save it from torment? Since it's immortal, it'll always exist. It took the blood of Christ. Peter reminds Christians of that in encouraging them to remain faithful when he said, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, your empty conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. First Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. What a price. The soul then is immortal. Psalm twenty two twenty six 26 says, Your heart shall live forever. You remember that though he had been dead for centuries, as I said earlier, Moses appeared very much alive in the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 25, or Luke 16, 19 through 31, and Matthew 25, 26, 46. There are three points here. I'll back up to Matthew 17, 1 through 9. Because they all have to do with looking at eternal punishment. They all have to do with looking at what happened to the rich man in Luke 16. And then there's Moses, Mount of Transfiguration. The ideal being we still exist. We still move and function and operate and think. We are what we are. So it's the most priceless possession I possess. How would you compare the worth of your soul so you could really understand it? I don't know other than the way Jesus did. You can exchange your soul for wealth and prosperity in this present world, Matthew 19, 16 through 26. That's what the rich young ruler did. The rich farmer did the same thing in Luke 12, 16 through 21. Men every day throughout history have exchanged their souls for wealth whenever they engage in illegitimate businesses or let that be the only thing that really dominates their mind. They partake in what we might call questionable things. And they put whatever's of this world before, they, before their Lord. You can exchange your soul for pleasure. Demas hath forsaken me, having love this present world, 2 Timothy 4.10. Some do that more than they love God, 2 Timothy 3.4. And on and on you can go. You can exchange your, your soul for popularity, whether it be Pilate seeking to keep his position trying to find some middle ground to be able to make the Jews happy and Caesar happy, Mark 15, 15. 
And it says in John 12, 42 through 44, that there were chief rulers who loved the praise of men more than they did the praise of God. What do you think those things are around today? Well, of course they are. And we must not let them cause us to sell our soul. To exchange our souls for any of these is the height of foolishness. None of them can really satisfy. I wonder how many people, if they would be honest, and some are, would say, I'm just sick of the life that I'm presently living. A person must reach that stage and realize that Christ is the only one that can offer me peace and happiness, consolation, even in the midst of trial and tribulation. But he can. I know this much, this world just won't last. Heaven and earth will pass away, Matthew 24, 35. The world passes away in the lust thereof, John wrote to Christians in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 17. We're taught that the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heath, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up, 2 Peter 3, 10. We know we can't take any thing with us of this present world. Job said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. And then we find in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The man who would gain the world at the expense of his soul is the great loser, of which there's no greater loser. And there's no way we can describe it any more than that. Closing the lesson, you must realize when you lose your soul, it's an eternal loss. It can't be restored. When you fail the schoolroom of life, there's no summer school to make it up. There's no taking the course over. There is no compensation offered you when you lose your soul. It's an entire loss, a complete loss, an eternal loss when we lose our souls. Thus, the loss of the soul is irreparable. Friendship can be lost and re regained. Health can even be improved once it's almost lost. Property can be lost and possibly later reclaimed. But, but how do you replace a soul? We appeal to old and young alike, but I especially appeal to young people who are not prepared to meet their God. And I ask, what are you really going to do with your life? It's all in your hands. Mom and Daddy, by the way, can't make you do a thing when it comes to serving God. You have to want to. It has to be important to you. You have to see the love of God and the love of Christ, and you have to see the worth of your soul. When you sit just simply thinking about the soul and it doesn't bother you that it's separated from God and if you died right now, you would be where the rich man was and is. That's true of all of us as to how we're serving God. But I remember the days when I was a young person. When I say young person, I mean early teens. And I remember the lure of the world as it was then. You're trying to shape things. You're trying to make decisions. You're trying to think. And you're in need of help. I'm very grateful. I can't be overly grateful for the parents I had, but especially for the preaching that I was under in those days. The preachers that I heard were that were at home they weren't well-known brotherhood-wise, some maybe a little bit. But the one thing they were known for, they understood the church. They understood the plan of salvation. They understood the worth of a soul. They understood 
what it meant in the Bible when it talked about our souls will be lost. And have we counted the cost if our souls should be lost? We can concentrate on this world and what it has to offer. All that grows old after a while. If it doesn't grow old while you're young, you get older, you'll find out there's no real answer in these things. So I close a lesson. We've studied what to do to become a Christian. By simply asking, have you really done deep, genuinely counted the cost if your soul should be lost? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it. Child of God, if you've left the truth, you need to repent and confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. There comes a time when you must make the decision. And God doesn't guarantee you any more days or any more time than you have right now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Show your love for God genuinely the only way you can. Rise up. Obey the gospel. Be reconciled to God, justified in His sight, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, your obedience to the gospel. And you can do that before you leave this building, and you ought to. And would you not do that while we stand and while we sing?